I'm excited about this message this morning because we're going to talk about the call of God in our lives. There's so many Christians that have a cultural calling. Cultural calling. What do you mean by that, cultural? Well, our society and how our culture calls us to certain things. You know, you, know, you can go to school and take a test and they will tell you where all your strengths and weaknesses are. And then they'll even direct you, this, this is probably the path that you should take, a, a path on education, a path in the industry, a path in engineering. And they'll tell you all that. That's cultural calling. What do you feel like you want to do? What do you like doing? What are your interests and so forth? That's a cultural calling. And so many Christians have a cultural calling. They follow each other on the latest trends around them. Have you noticed that? Look at the church. Christians follow the trends. What's that church doing over there? Uh, we're no longer committed to a church, which I think we should be. And unfortunately, there are those that are teaching. You can be committed to the church, though, and go from one church to another church, to, to, to a college, to another Bible college, and all over the place, and you can just go wherever you feel led to go. But really, you're being led by someone else, because that's where they're all going. That's where all my friends are going, and so forth. So you notice that there's a trend. So Christians begin to look more like who? Like each other. They start dressing like each other, acting like each other, liking the same musicians, liking the same churches, liking the same atmosphere, and so forth, and they all look like each other. But God has called us to be like, God has not called us to be like those around us, he has called us to be like who? Jesus. That's important. Let me say that again. God hasn't called us to be like one another. God has called us to be like Jesus. Nothing more, nothing less. Jesus. That's who we want to be like. I don't want to be like my friend. I don't want to be like my relatives. I don't want to be like my wife. I want to be like Jesus. And when I'm like Jesus, my wife gets ministered to. When I'm like Jesus, my friends will be closer friends. We need to be like Jesus. Our calling is nothing less than to conform to the one that we follow and his character, and that is Jesus. We really should be following Jesus and no one other than that. And we're going to talk about that this morning. We left off in verse 17 where... Matthew says, from that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so that's the step to salvation, is that repenting, agreeing with God that we are sinners and that uh, we need to repent from our sins and we need to uh, realize that heaven is coming shortly after. We have an application here at the church, and I was noticing is we're getting a lot of applications for ministry right now. So God is doing a... A great work. People are, are, are stepping up and they want to get involved and actually do something in the church, which is good. I think it's biblical to do something in the church, be active and serving. And, and so these applications I'm noticing on the um, questionnaire part of it, I, I ask, describe who you are. And I remember that question uh, given to me when I filled out an application for affiliation with Calvary Chapel. And so you, you get a question like that, and you're like, what do they want? Because that's the first thing you ask. What are they asking me? What do they want to hear? And so I just put on there, describe who I am. And the first thing I put was, well, I'm a sinner by nature. I fall short. Uh, I have flaws. Oh, I don't get it right all the time. I struggle with things. Uh, I'm not always kind. I'm not always good. I get frustrated at times. That, that's my sinful nature. Um, I, I need Jesus more and more in my life. I need to put him first in my life. Uh, I'm hoping that I have a desire for Jesus and that a desire would, would cause me to grow in, in knowledge and understanding and in relationships and so forth. That's who I am. But so often I read, I'm a good person. I'm a kind person. I'm a loving person. I'm a, you know, this type of person. I'm like, okay, those are good things. Those are good things too. And it's good to have that view of ourselves. But who are we really? Who are we really? See, we need to understand that really we're sinners. And we need to repent and turn to God. Otherwise, we're lost for eternity. Jesus here 
after preaching this message, begins his own independent ministry apart from John the Baptist. Remember, John is in prison now. John must decrease. Christ must increase. And so Jesus now is going to take off where John left off, and he's going to start assembly or a group of disciples that he will equip himself to become co-workers with him in the ministry so jesus is the beginning of the church and he's the example of how church functions he will begin to be the shepherd the pastor the overseer and he will then choose the men that he will call into the ministry and he chooses like 120 we kind of forget that we think well he only chose 12 no he chose over 120 men and women to come follow him and then from the 120 12 were left the rest took off couldn't take it anymore it's too hard for them and we see that happening all the time in the church people just can't take it anymore pleasures of life things going on in their lives and so they take off and so you're left with 12 men and we always believe that 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 they are the ones jesus chose and they are but they were the ones that were left too at the same time that could endure that could handle jesus and his words and understandings Uh, Even if they didn't understand them, they just stuck with him because they knew he was the way, the truth, and the life. And no one could get to the Father but through him. And so he's raising up disciples here. And so I've themed this message this morning, follow me, not me, follow Christ. Follow Christ. That is what Jesus wants in our lives. Not to follow man. You shouldn't be following me. I'm just a man. I'm an under-shepherd of Christ. I have flaws. I make mistakes. I have uh, personality flaws. I deal with things differently than other people deal with them. I have my own struggles, but I am leading this church by following Jesus, and I hope that you'll follow Jesus, and by doing so, we will follow Jesus together in the work that he has for us here in this community. So we see in verses 18 through 22 the call of Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Let's look at verse 18. And Jesus, walking... By the Sea of Galilee, the Sea of Galilee is is basically 13 uh, miles long and about 6 miles wide. So it's a good length of 13 miles of of walking. Now he sees two brothers, Simon, called Peter. Uh, Peter in in the Greek is stone or or rock, Petra, uh, but small, not like Christ, the big rock. And Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. So there, there's Jesus walking along the Sea of Galilee, and he looks out by the sea, and, and there is Peter and Andrew, and they are fishing. They're, they're casting their nets into the sea. They're working. This is their occupation. What a beautiful occupation, right? I'd love to have that job, fishing all day long. Of course, I guess it would get tiresome after years and years and years of fishing and smelling like fish and eating fish and drinking fish. You know, I mean, it could, it could get mundane, I guess. But they're out there enjoying themselves, working hard, and Jesus sees them. He sees them out there. Now, this wasn't the first time that Jesus uh, meets Peter and Andrew. The gospel tells us that he met them earlier. And so Jesus, again, is collecting disciples. And he's calling men, he's calling women, and he's seeing different individuals that are out there. And he's taking the opportunity to draw them to himself. We find Peter and Andrew here are brothers. And so God calls families. He doesn't just call an individual. He calls a husband, he calls a wife, he calls the children into discipleship. The more popular one here is Peter, obviously. We all know Peter. We don't know a whole lot about Andrew, but we know Peter himself. Matthew uses the word Peter, his name, 23 times. He uses the name Simon in about five places. And so we know a lot about Peter. We know Peter denied the Lord. We know Peter was close to the Lord. We know that Peter and Jesus had a lot of interaction. Uh, There's a lot of scriptures with, with Jesus and Peter talking with one another. Sometimes Jesus rebukes Peter. Sometimes Peter's trying to rebuke Jesus. I mean, they just had such a great relationship with one another. So he's well known. Where we know hardly anything about Andrew. Now, Peter's the first one to be called, though, according to Matthew's account here. And apart from this place in the list of the 12 apostles, Andrew is not identified anywhere else but right here in this gospel. Also, these two are great at fishing. They know what they're doing. They've been doing it for a long time. It's their occupation. Um, they've They've been successful at it. They've made a living at it. It's brought provisions for their family. They've provided for their 
their households. Peter was even able to buy a house where his wife and his children could probably stay, having a mother-in-law staying with him. You remember that, that Peter... His mother-in-law got sick and sick, and Jesus had to come and heal her. So it was a successful business for Peter. Fishing. He made some money doing it. It seems to be their fishing message is, is using this net, though. It wasn't just a pole. He understood about mass production. He understood about uh, taking in as much as you can with least amount of work. And so he created these nets, not that he created the nets, but he used these nets. And these nets were usually weighted on the ends, and you would throw them into the water, and as they're sinking, they're gathering fish. Then he would pull the nets up and, and hopefully get a good amount of fish with him. He was a fisherman. He was a smart fisherman. He knew what he was doing. And verse 19 said that Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. There's the call right there. The call into the ministry. Peter, Andrew... Follow me, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. An apprenticeship which prepares them for carrying out the call of Jesus. Peter and Andrew, come follow me, and I will train you. I will give you what you need, so that when I'm gone, you will take over. As you follow me, I will equip you for the work that I've called you. God does that in our lives. He calls us. He doesn't always call us away from work, doesn't always call us to leave our households, but he calls us into the ministry. He calls us to follow him. When I got saved, I, I was just like blown away that God would first save me and that I had eternal life, that I was going to heaven. I mean, that just excited me a lot. And so I wanted to get to know who he was. And so I studied the word of God. I went from Genesis all the way through the book of Revelation, reading it, and reading it every year, every year, reading it over and over and over again, because I want to know who this Jesus is who has called me to be his disciple. I never felt called into the ministry as far as full-time ministry or being a pastor. I just wanted to serve Jesus wherever I was at. And when I got called to a church here in this area, Mariloma, it used to be Calvary Chapel, Mariloma, I was happy just serving there wherever. I started off cleaning toilets, sweeping the floors, vacuuming, washing the windows, and so forth. We used to have a divider between the sanctuary and the main uh, lobby area, and the windows there would wash them really good so people can see in and out. Uh, we had chairs out there for overflow. I mean, I just did whatever it took, and I loved it. But I didn't realize that I was under a apprenticeship of, G of Jesus Christ. I don't think my pastor even realized it. He probably did because he knew the word. But we're under an apprenticeship. God is training us for the work. And he puts us through things in our lives. That was a, a hard ministry. Ministry is hard. Serving is hard because you're dealing with work. And people don't like to work. We live in a day and age where behind the computer, we like that. But don't send me out to pull weeds. Don't send me out to cut branches. Don't, don't send me to throw out the trash and so forth. That's, that's work. Let someone else do that. Mom and dad, you do that. And you find mom and dad doing pretty much everything while the kids are laying in bed playing video games, right? And we're not teaching our kids what it means to work. We're too scared that we might lose them. You lost them already. You should have trained them. You should have trained them to work. You should have trained them to be servants. And so God puts us in an apprenticeship. He allows us to interact with relationships and with people and so forth so that he he strengthens us and gives us abilities and understandings of certain situations and things so that when we get into the ministry, we're ready to follow him even more deeply and more committed, more committed. You know, it, following Jesus in the calling is not a, a one-year program. It's not a one-year apprenticeship. It's, it's not a five-year or a ten-year. It is a lifetime. You don't quit. The Bible even says no man puts his hands to the plow and then looks back. Jesus said he's not even worthy for the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus said. That's what the Bible says. You look back. You're not worthy for the kingdom of God. God wants you on the plow. He wants you going forward, and it's work. You ever plow? I have a little tiller. It's gas-powered, and you want a, a, a rear tiller, not a forward tiller. Because you put one in the front, you're going with it like this. 
because it just takes you all over there and it doesn't even till. It just hits the top of the dirt, you know, and pulls you all over there. The rear one now, you push down and it gets deep and you're uh, pushing at and tilling the dirt, bringing it up. And so that's work. Can you imagine during the time of Jesus when he said you can't put your hands on a plow? You're talking about a horse, two pieces of wood with a piece of metal that digs into the ground and you're really trying to work this thing with a horse pulling you. That is work. The tiller is easy compared to a horse. He says, yet if you look back, which is, it's understandable that you would want to look back working that hard. No, you know what? This is kind of hard here. Can I just kind of take a break and look back a little bit? Jesus says, you're not worthy for the kingdom of God. Well, he wasn't serious, was he? <laughs> I hope not. How many times have I looked back? Yeah, I've looked back quite a few myself. You see, that's why we need Jesus even more. Because we fail him all the time. And so we just come back and grab hold of those plows again and say, okay, Lord, give me strength. Give me the ability. Let me keep plowing forward with you, Lord. It's an apprenticeship. He put me through an apprenticeship. And he blessed me in that apprenticeship and prepared me for the work that he's doing to this day. The Greeks suggest that they were busy fishing with their nets when Jesus called them ministering. So they were literally at work. The call to minister is by the Lord himself, by the way. You can't call yourself into the ministry. You can't force your way into the ministry. It's something that Jesus does. John fifteen sixteen says, You did not choose me. And he's talking to his disciples. You did not choose me, but I chose you and anointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. That whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give to you. You haven't chosen me. I've chosen you, and I have anointed you. Uh, too many people think, well, no, God's, I've called God, and God needs me for the ministry, and this is how it's going to be done. No, no, no. God calls you, and you're under an apprenticeship, and you do it the way he has called you to do it according to his word. And then you'll bring forth fruit. And when you call on him, he will answer you. Usually in Judaism, you would... As a disciple, seek out a rabbi. You go, okay, who's the, who's the most famous rabbi around? Am I able to hang out with that rabbi? Can I afford it? Can I, can I take the drive out to him, or do I have to stick around with a more closer rabbi? And so you usually chose the rabbi. But here Jesus is very clear that, no, you don't choose me. I choose you. And this call clearly points to a lasting relationship because it is Jesus who chooses and it is Jesus who keeps the same time and Jesus is not inviting them to a nice stroll along the seashore either he's inviting them to discipleship he's inviting them for a personal attachment to him he's inviting them to a hard missions trip because it is a life missions trip and we know from the scriptures that later on every apostle will die for their faith they'll all become martyrs for Jesus Christ that's the call of God you know, I stand here and I tell you that when I first got saved, I thought, man, everything's going to be great. God saved me. I'm going to heaven. My life is straightening out. I'm not doing drugs anymore. I'm not out partying. I'm not cheating on my wife. You know, I'm, I'm taking care of my kids. I have this deeper love for them. Uh, I'm going to church. I'm like, boy, what, what, what can go wrong? What can go wrong? I came out of a religious system where, where people were backbiting and hurting one another and calling each other names and so forth. What can go wrong now? Boy, was I wrong in that thinking. Because now I got introduced to the church, which is sick. <laughs> the church is sick because it's still filled with people. And I, I got a rude awakening when I got into ministry and realized people are people. As Randy said this morning, we're sheep, and sheep are dumb. They don't always follow the shepherd. They're wandering off, and that's why they have a dog to kind of help the shepherd round them back in. And you let one sheep go off a cliff, do you know what the other sheep will do? They'll follow that sheep right off the cliff. That's why we don't follow the sheep. We follow Jesus. We follow Jesus. So many times I've seen Christians follow another Christian. Oh, they're right. They're my friend. No, they're not. Especially when they're leading you away from the church, leading you away from fellowship in the body of Christ, leading you away from truth. They're not your friend. They're your enemy because they're crippling your relationship with Jesus Christ. We've got to follow Jesus and not be like the dumb sheep. Be smart and follow the shepherd's voice. 
<clears throat> Jesus said, I will make you fishers of men here. Then verse 20, immediately, he, immediately they left immediately, or abandon is the Greek word, their nets, and followed him. And follow literally in the sense of walking behind him. They literally just dropped everything and boop, followed him. Total abandonment of their, of their lifestyle, of their living, of their material possessions. They left everything to follow Jesus. We like a Christianity that revolves around catering to ourselves. We really do. Look at the church today. We, we want a Christianity that doesn't cost us anything. We, we don't have to, a, a minimum amount of, of involvement, you know. Um, not too much involvement. Just enough that it doesn't put a burden on me. Because if it puts a burden on me, then it's too much and I need to back off because it's too much of a burden for me. I'm glad Jesus didn't do that while he was on the cross. Oh, wait, this is too much. You know, I took about 150,000 men's sins right now, so the other, you know, billions, forget them, because this is too much of a burden for me. No, he took it all on his shoulders. He didn't quit. But we want ministries to cater around us. It's just amazing how many people have come to the church, and you don't have a youth ministry? Oh, okay, well, then they're gone. Oh, you don't have a singles ministry? Oh, oh, okay, they're gone. We had a guy here years ago. And he just got, I got to get married, Pastor. I got to get married. I got to get married. Like, you know, you've got to just wait on the Lord. Adam didn't go looking for a wife. God brought him a wife. You wait till God brings you a wife. And she will be a godly wife, a loving wife, a life that puts Jesus first. That's what kind of wife you want. No, 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 I got to get a wife. I got to get a wife. And he left because we had, had no women that were here single. And you notice that in our church, we don't have a lot of single women. We have more single men than women so you have to wait in this church if you're looking for a wife here and unfortunately you get into trouble because you're looking for a wife and this guy took off i had no idea where he's at he went to harvest because there are a lot more single women at harvest see that's fishing and that's fishing in your own strength and you're going to get in trouble when you do that no it means uh, abandonment of everything and of possessions Uh, though we like the christianity revolves around us, catering to us, uh, when the central message of the gospel really is what? To abandon self, isn't it? Jesus said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve. We are to abandon self. We don't like that in America. Because in America, we are, we are not a service country. We are a receiving a service. Everything in America is about what we can get out of society, not what we can give. The call to discipleship clearly meant separation from the kind of life that they had been living before, but it did not mean that they had to sell everything and break every earthly tie. It's not what Jesus calls us to do, and we saw that with Peter. He had a house, he had a mother-in-law, so he still had that house as he was serving the Lord, but eventually he gave it all, even his life for the Lord. I uh, I was challenged by the Lord back... um, Oh, God, it's, it's already 11 years ago. 11 years ago, when I was working for Southern California Edison, I know I've shared this before, uh, good job. Let me back up a little bit more. Virginia got pregnant at the age of 15. And so at 15, I was working a job or two after school. And summer came, I'd work three jobs. And then on the weekend. So I did whatever it took to provide for her and for Modesto so he can have food. And he ate a lot. And then Simon at the age of 18 when, when he came. And we got married. And then Moses and then Roman at 21. And at, by that point, um, God had been leading me to work for Southern California Edison. And he put me in right places. I met a Christian man. That's where I f- first was introduced to Christianity. He gave me my first Bible. So he helped me get into Southern California Edison. And so I started working for that company, went from a $7 an hour job to a $14 an hour job. Now, for a a poor Mexican man, doubling your income is pretty good. That's pretty good. And then from that point on, you can see this pay scale just rising to eventually when I went out to the field, it was going to be $24 an hour. And that was back then. By the time I was in the field, uh, for several years, I was making $32 an hour. And that was just the entry-level position. And then I went into the journeyman's position, and I was making $38 an hour. And when I left, it was close to almost $40, $42 an hour. 
And that wasn't uh, counting overtime. So I was making good money, and God provided for our family. But at that time, the church was also growing. And the demands on me and my wife were growing. And so for me to work and then to be here it was really difficult. It was becoming hard because I not only taught here, but I also cut the grass and cleaned the grounds. I also took care of the, the tape ministry and, and putting the stickers on them and passing them out to people who purchased the studies and so forth. I was also involved with every, pretty much everything, counting in between, and then counseling you know, in between the couples and marrieds and, and burials. Thank God that I worked for a company that gave me at that time, I was, I was getting a five weeks a year of vacation. So most of my vacation time was for the ministry. We would take maybe a couple of weeks and go out and do family things like at the beach and so forth for a week or two, but usually it was all for, for the church. And I just realized, and God said, it's time to quit. God said, it's time to leave your job. Like That's a big step. I don't think Virginia's going to let me. I, I'm, she's going to you know, want me not to quit because how are we going to be provided for? And so I came to tell her, and the Lord had already prepared her. She says, I know it's time to quit. I just have too much to do. And you'd be torn between the two. And so we prepared ourselves. We paid everything off. We got two brand new cars. We put in a brand new air conditioner. And we, we, we did as much as we could so that we could last, because we figured 10 years from now we should be doubled, you know, and... and you know, hopefully be able to recoup some of that you know, in our own lives. Uh, it didn't happen that way, by the way. Another, another lesson I learned. God wanted us to trust in Him. And so from this day forward, uh, we trusted in Him, and He's always been faithful to take care of our needs. But God calls us at times to quit our jobs, just like He called these two men to quit their jobs. Leave it all. I didn't sell my house. We were close to selling a house. We, we may sell our house in the future. Who knows? what God has, but he is in total control. Uh, everything's starting to break down now, and so I just lost a car, so now we're down to one car. You know, but God knows, and he's going to provide for us. I believe that 100% because he's the one that called me into the ministry and Virginia, and he's going to take care of us just as he took care of the disciples. The call of Jesus totally disrupts your life. It really does. Have you noticed that? It disrupts your life? For good, though. Not for bad. Your life is on one track. And when you're called to a disciple, unless you're called, if you're not called to discipleship and you haven't answered that call, then your life is still on that track. It's not as disruptive. But all of a sudden, it's every Sunday go to church. And Wednesdays too, that's different now. I, I've never done that before. And then men's studies and breakfasts and conferences, you know, that's really strange. And, and you realize, well, I'm doing more of that now than what I was doing hanging out with the family, going to barbecues, you know, visiting here, visiting over there, I do less of that and doing more of this. That's kind of strange. It's disrupting my life a little bit. Big events. Now you want to serve. Oh boy, now I got to serve. That means now I got to study at home during the week to prepare to serve at church. That's different. That's disruptive. See, God calls us and when he calls us it does disrupt our lives. You, you be sure of it. It will. It will change your life completely. There's no doubt about it. And no one that entangles himself with the nets of this world um, will continue to follow Jesus. They just won't. They will eventually step back. They will come at all costs, though, without questions, because they are his disciples. No net can keep you from following him. The cost, it will cost you your life, relationship, time, and you will be asked to do something you don't want to hear. That's Christianity, and that's the call of God. And it's not just a pastor. I'm speaking for all of us. For all of us. You'll realize that your yard starts being neglected because you're spending too much time at church. But this is good because this is what God has called us to do. It will disrupt your life in relationships. I've lost a lot of relationships from work, from family. I've lost them because of this calling because of my commitment to truth, because of my commitment to following Jesus. I'm not going to follow a man. I'm not going to follow someone's philosophy. I'm going to follow Jesus and what I believe he's saying in the word of God. And sometimes that hurts. That, sometimes that hurts. 
I just had to, um, partly because of injury, but uh, we had uh, uh, Virginia's brother passed away. And I just really felt the Lord telling me, let the dead bury the dead. And that's how I felt. And that's scriptural. Come follow me first and just follow me. And so I didn't participate in that. I just continued to follow Jesus, and I felt Jesus told me that. So I followed him. I lost a lot of family members because of that. But I'm going to follow Jesus. He's the one that I'm concerned about, not anyone else. It costs you. It costs you your relationships. It costs you your time. <sighs> time is very valuable to a lot of us. A lot of us. But all of a sudden you find yourself with little time because you're serving the Lord so much. You know, Fred started uh, serving here because he hasn't been working. If I can share, Fred. And, and so he's been serving here. And that's always a, a, a blessing, especially for those who have served here in the past who who, who lost their job. And usually when they start serving here, guess what? They find work right away because the enemy doesn't want them serving. He just doesn't want them serving. And, and so they find jobs and then they're off doing their job. And so Fred's serving here and he's faithful. And boy, I love the way he serves. He's, he's my kind of uh, maintenance uh, tender. I mean, he, everything is spick and span. He's walking around always looking on the ground, looking for weeds. I notice that stuff. Picking up papers, he's talking to people looking down, he'll pick up things. I love that because he's committed to what God is calling him to do. He just got a job. <laughs> God is good. I'm like, okay, Fred, so it's been nice knowing you. He goes, no, 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 no. I can come on Tuesdays right after work. It's not far and I'll be here on Tuesdays. And I know him, he's going to be here. And he's going to be committed to clean the grounds. I said, whatever you can't get, we'll get on Wednesday mornings again. And I'll guarantee you that he's probably going to get it all. He was out working already this, this morning, probably not even on a payroll, but that's his, his gift. He, he loves doing that and staying busy. When God calls you, it costs you your time, and now he's trying to manage all the time in between. But he's, his time is also involving Jesus Christ himself. It cost us, and it also it cost us something that we don't even know what that will be because he'll ask us to do something that we weren't ready for. I wasn't ready to be in the ministry. I didn't want to be in the ministry. Uh, we lost recently, several years ago, uh, a female that we brought into the house. She was really close to us here in the church, re really rather involved. Uh, she spent Thanksgivings and, and Christmases with us and so forth. And all of a sudden, one day, I'm like, Where, where's so-and-so? haven't seen her for a couple of weeks. And then it was a couple months. Then it was three months. They're gone. What happened? I have no idea. They're just gone. Stuff like that hurts. You know, you create these relationships. And then all of a sudden, they're just gone. And you don't know why. Was it me? Was it someone else? Who knows? I don't know. Could you say something? Could you just say bye? You know, it's been at least nice, <laughs> you know, knowing you. You know, and now I'm off because the Lord's leading me. That stuff hurts. But we don't understand that. And by the way, pastors do have feelings. And things do hurt them. We want them to be a piece of concrete at times. And then if you're a concrete, then we want them to be uh, putty, too, at the same time. And if you're not putty enough, then we want you to be silly putty, you know? I mean, they just they want you one way or they want you the other way. It's like in some, some of these relationships I counseled, my wife wants me to work, but she wants me also to work less. So which one do I do? doesn't matter. You're, you're wrong in either way. <laughs> it's like you don't win, no win situation. And that's the pastor's job, though. And so you continue to follow Jesus. Someone recently close to us uh, recently uh, made a comment about Virginia and I. Uh, they said, you know, in their home, it's just everything's about God. The radio's on all the time. There's scriptures all over the place. They talk about God. They talk about not doing this. They talk about this is what Christians do. And it's like, it's crazy. They just talk about God all the time. And it was an accusation against us. Because we were all about God in our home. You know, what a good thing to be accused of, though, right? If you're going to be accused of anything, that would be the thing you want to be accused of. You come to our house, you'll see the scripture right above the door. It's for me and my house, we serve the Lord. Very clear. So that's a disclaimer to you. Beware. You come to our house, you're going to hear about the Lord. Because that's all we do. People get mad at me because that's all I know. I don't want to talk about Mayweather and Pachaco or Pacheco or whoever it was that was, I mean, I was into that stuff. I mean, I heard he pulled uh, Sugar Ray, and you probably don't even know who Sugar Ray is. That's how long ago. 
He pulled a sugar rain, was dancing all over the place, you know. No, I want to know about Jesus. I have an enemy right now that I'm fighting personally, the Satan himself. I get enough worries with him than worry about Mayweather or Mayflare, Flurry, Flurry, whatever his name is. And yet someone comes in and says, oh, they just love Jesus all the time. Good thing to be accused of. A.W. Tozer said this, I want the presence of God himself, or I don't want anything at all to do with religion. I want all that God has, or I don't want anything at all. And that's what I want. I'm sorry that you come to my house and there's Bibles laying around and the radio's 24 hours on K-Wave. We listen to it all day long. It never comes off. It plays through the whole night because if there's a demon there, he'll be gone when he hears the word of God coming out. That's just the way it is. That's the way it's in our house. Years ago, same accusation. A relative went to my pastor and said, can you talk to him? He says, always Jesus, Jesus this and Jesus that and Jesus, Jesus. That's all he talks about. Could you kind of like calm him down? The pastor looked at them and said, wow, I wish I had 10 more of him. That was his answer. No, we don't want to talk about Jesus. We want to talk about work. We want to talk about the latest fling, what's going on, and this and that, you know. There's a lot to talk about Jesus. We need more of him. <clears throat> They're suffering with Jesus. Paul suffered in so many different ways. Uh, he, he lists them in 2 Corinthians 11, 20 through to 28. He says, besides all these things, he talks about uh, stripes minus one. He's talking about Jews that were attacking him. He's talking about stoning. He's talking about shipwrecks. He's talking about being in deep waters. He's talking about perilous times and robbers and countrymen and Gentiles and cities and wilderness and seas. And then he says, besides those things, there's other things. What comes upon me daily? My deep concerns, and this was the thing that hurt him the most, my deep concerns for all the churches on top of that. Not just the attacks and all the accusations, but then the, his concern for people's souls, that they're not getting it. You know, it hurts more when I see people not really serving the Lord, when I see them not committed to God, when I see them wishy-washy in their walk when they shouldn't be. I have this, I, I have this philosophy, personal philosophy, I, I believe that we're all adults, right? We're over 18. You're an adult. You're considered an adult. You have voting rights over 21. You can drink if you want. You know, you're an adult. You're responsible for yourself. And so I have this philosophy. I'm going to treat you like an adult. <laughs> Why would I treat you any other way? Uh, you should be responsible for what God's called you to do. And you should do it for His glory. I shouldn't have to remind anyone to do anything. I shouldn't have to push or prod or any of those things. And sometimes I listen to some of these younger pastors, and they're like, yeah, we tell our church to do this. They can't do it. Get out, this and that. You know, Hey, they have a responsibility. You have a responsibility. We're all adults here. My philosophy is we should understand those things as we're studying and reading God's words that we are disciples of Jesus Christ. We're to follow him. And in following him, we're reading his word. In verse 21, it says, Going from there, he saw two others, brothers, brothers James and the son of Zebedee and John, his brother. And they were in a boat with Zebedee, their father, mending um, their nets. And he called them. Two more brothers. He saw them literally working, mending their nets. They were actually putting their nets together because they would rip apart while they were pulling the fish up. And so they're literally in the work, and Jesus calls them. Also, right in the middle of working. And immediately, verse 22, they left their boat and their father, and they followed him. So, family... They left their family. Jesus in one point uh, said, uh, if you're not willing to leave your mother, your brother, your father, your sisters, then you're not worthy. He says, because it's sometimes it costs that. The Lord calls us at times to do those things. The men and women that God calls, <clears throat> let me share with you who the people that God calls. Because God doesn't just call radical men. I was not a radical man. I was a very shy person. I didn't like talking a lot with people. I, I wasn't in crowds. I stayed to myself. I wasn't outgoing. I'm not a great communicator. I just, leave me alone. I'm, I'm fine here doing my job and living with my family. I didn't, I didn't really get involved in stuff. And, and people think, well, God calls intelligent, great, wise men and women uh, with great gifts. No, he doesn't. It's the opposite. God calls people like me. God calls people like you into the kingdom of God. He calls you. 
Whoever you are right now who thinks, no, God hasn't called me. I don't, I don't, I'm not worthy. I don't have any gifts. I don't know what I would do. No, he's calling you to work in the kingdom of God. These are the men that God calls, the men and women. Jesus is calling what he sees at hand. He doesn't have a list. Okay, they, uh, they have to be this race. They have to have this height and this weight and this ability. And, and they have to have this temper and this personality. He doesn't do that. He says, Who's here? Oh, come on, follow me. He says, whoever's at hand, this is who I call. He called 120 men and women to follow him. He didn't just choose the 12. He called them all, said, come follow me, and we'll see what happens from there. And many of them walked away. God uses those who are hurt. He uses those who are hurt. A.W. Tozer said, it is doubtful whether God can bless a man greatly until he has been hurt deeply. He understood that. <clears throat> Disciples would be hurt. They left their families. That hurts. They left their livelihoods. That hurts. They left relations. That, that hurts. Uh, they went into a hostile area where people would call them names. They would accuse them. They would threaten them. That hurts. And that's the people that God calls. Hurting people. Uh, hurts in our own relations. Hurts in our lives and so forth those that God choose. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Wow, we really went over. <clears throat> it's because we started late, so I have a couple of minutes. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Look at verse 20 with me. Here's who God calls. Where is the wise? And these are questions that Paul is asking. And Paul is just mimicking Jesus. You know, we know what Jesus just did, calling these four men. Leave your nets, leave everything, surrender yourself to me, follow me. And so then Paul takes that same philosophy. He says, we're the wise, we're the scribes, we're the disputers of the ages, we're these guys that are great debaters and so forth. Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believed. So the wisdom of this world is nothing. It's nothing compared to the simple message of the gospel. That Christ came and he died and he was buried and he resurrected to give us eternal life. That is a simple message. Anybody can give that message. That is wisdom right there. And he says, a world's wisdom is foolishness. Now drop down to verse 26. For you see your calling, brethren. So many people are called during the Paul, time of Paul to the Corinthians. That not many wise according to the flesh. Not many of you are wise people in fact i kind of say you're dumb <laughs> that's what he's saying here you're not wise at all you're kind of dumb in the eyes of the world you don't know what's up you don't even know what's down not many mighty you don't even have mighty strength you know you're not powerful at all you're you're weak some say that paul was a tiny little man skin and bones compared to everyone else and so he says not many mighty not not many nobles you're not called of nobility. You don't come from rich families and so forth. He says, not many noble are called. Are called. God doesn't call those people. Not many of them. Yeah, there's a few. And we have very intelligent Christian men out there who are theologians and so forth and are not diminishing their places at all. That's rare. God calls the majority of unwise, unmighty, and noble people. He says, but God has chosen what? The foolish things, the foolish things. Uh, I have a little note here that I took. And I, it must have been from another pastor's message. And it says moron. <laughs> it says moron. God has chosen the moron things of the world to put to shame the wise and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty and the base things of the world and the things which are displeased, which are displeased, despised God has chosen and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. I've been called moron. I've been called stupid, unwise, don't know what I'm doing. I've been called all those things. And yet people get saved. Well, this moron can't get the glory. <laughs> it's God who gets the glory. At least they're saved. 
Call me what you want. I'm going to continue to serve Jesus. I'm not going anywhere. I hope that you won't go anywhere either. You'll just follow Jesus. These are the people that God calls. Let me give you a list of who God calls. Let me give you a list of who God calls. Listen to this. Peter had a temper, and he denied Jesus. David had an affair with Bathsheba and had a little bit illegitimate child. Noah was drunk. Jonah ran from God. Paul was a murderer. Gideon was insecure. Marion was a gossiper. Martha was a worrier. Thomas was a doubter. Isaac was a daydreamer. Jacob was a liar. Leah was ugly. Joseph was abused. Samson had long hair, and he was a womanizer. Rahab was a prostitute. Jeremiah and Timothy were too young. Isaiah preached naked. Jonah ran from God. Naomi was a widow. Job went bankrupt. John the Baptist ate bugs and honey. The disciples fell asleep while Jesus was praying. Martha worried about everything. The Samaritan woman was divorced, not once, but more than once. Timothy had an ulcer. Sarah was impatient. Elijah was suicidal. Moses shuddered at things. Zacharias was short. Abraham was old. And Lazarus was dead. These are the people that God uses. And we want to lift everyone up to higher standards. These are the standards of God. But it's God who lifts us up. It is God who educates us. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I know who I am. I'm not a great speaker. For me to, to, to even give you a summary of certain things is very difficult for me to do. I know that I'm not the greatest example. I know that I'm not the greatest leader. But you know what? In all of those weaknesses, Christ is doing something here. It doesn't matter whether we have 10,000 or 1,000 or 150 people. Christ is doing something in the lives of people through this moron. And he can do things through you, through you too, if you're willing to be his disciple. Because God uses people who are patiently waiting to be used. Moses waited 80 years to be used. Elijah waited three years. John the Baptist, 30 years for Jesus. Jesus waited 30 years to go to the cross. Paul waited three years in the wilderness. So he can use us if we wait upon him. Now we come to the last two verses, and basically Jesus begins his ministry here as he teaches and heals many of the multitude. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. Now we love that, right? Yeah, Jesus, come and heal us. We receive the gospel, bring healing, and he does. I think I've seen probably about two or three healings in my lifetime. 30 years of knowing the Lord, three, three healings, so, so once every 10 years. It's rare that we see healings today. There are more healings taking place in these third world countries where all they have is, is their faith and trust in Jesus. That's where the healings are taking place. Here we have Cedar sinai you know, We have Loma Linda. We have you know, Beverly Hills uh, hospitals and so forth. So we don't have to depend on Jesus too much. And so we don't see the healings that, that Jesus really wants to do. But he begins his teaching and his preaching, and what comes along with that is healings. And then his fame went through all of Syria, and they brought to him all the sick, people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments, and those who were demon-possessed, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them all. So his popularity began to grow. He get, began to focus on the gospel message. And great multitudes followed him from Galilee, from Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. So, so he was growing in popularity. Unfortunately, all of those people were not disciples of Jesus Christ. They just wanted something from Jesus Christ. I, I posted this. This is my saying. There are true believers and there are wannabe believers. The wannabe believers are the wannabe in heaven believers, but they have no righteous living. They have no foundation and no moral values. They're just living their life, but they want to be in heaven. And they know that it's through Jesus Christ, and they've accepted him into their hearts, but there's no righteous living. There's no sacrifice of their life for fruits of God's righteousness or even obedience to his word. They're the wannabe believers. God wants strong faithful, surrendered people to follow after him. Now you might say, but I can't. 
Or how can God use me? Well, we just saw that God can use anybody. He can use a moron like me. He can use a donkey for Balaam. He can use anybody if we're willing to surrender our lives to him. And he will use you in great ways, even if it's just to touch one, of, one child in a children's ministry. Even if it's just to clean and to pick up paper, it's for his glory and his kingdom. He will use us wherever you're at if we humble ourselves before him. These are the people that God uses, and he wants to use you in the kingdom of God.